It is time for our weekly uh, check-in with State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy for our Tacky Talks. How are you, Tacky? Oh, doing well, Joe. It's a beautiful Friday. It looks like it's going to be almost like an early summer feeling this coming weekend until it rains. Uh, so it's only up and up from here. Yeah, it's, you know, it's definitely turning to allergy season <laughs> as well. Lots of folks are dealing with that. I know you have uh, problems with that yourself. Yeah, it, itchy eyes. I mean, the, actually, the mask helps keep some of the pollen out of your um, respiratory. But, I mean, I'm getting some more itchy eyes than anything else. And it's kind of weird, right? We live in a COVID world, but the, the mask provides a little bit of protection against the pollen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, there are a lot of benefits I think people are going to find. And even, you know, post-pandemic, I think we're going to see more masks than we ever did before, for sure. Yeah, it's a good time to buy stock in masks. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely an investment in the future. What, uh, what happened on Beacon Hill this week we should know about? It's been a very quiet week on the Hill uh, overall. Budget is going to come out next Wednesday. House Ways and Means is going to make a recommendation and amendments will be doing Friday. Uh, Patriot's Day week is an off week, but obviously none of us are going anywhere. Uh, there's no marathon. I mean, the city would be extremely quiet. Normally, Patriots, they, Patriots Week in Boston is actually very busy because of the marathon. People stick around and enjoy the city. Um, and we generally take that you know, week away besides being school vacation week because the city is very busy. And it gives ways and means a full week to reveal, you know, most likely going to be 900 to 1,200 amendments. So Patriots Day Week tends to be pretty quiet. So next Wednesday, House Ways and Means budget. Next Friday, amendments due. A week for Ways and Means to look at amendments. And then starting the Monday after that, we'll start our debate on the budget. And again, we'll be doing this by Microsoft Teams uh, Secure Telephone Network. Um, I don't know what start time is. I don't know how many days it is. Uh, obviously, the last budget was unusual because we did it so deep into the fiscal year, uh, into winter time. Um, and given the fiscal crises, there weren't as many amendments uh, because we kind of knew there was not a lot of money. But you know, there's uh, stabilization this year. So I think people have, uh, may have seen the article that we're above benchmark. Um, for the year so far in collections, about April fooling coming in, even though we've delayed our tax uh, collection to May, uh, we are above benchmark. I do think we were very conservative in numbers, is, even though we're above benchmark now. We're not above benchmark from pre-pandemic levels. So I think the news was kind of like a little bit deceptive here that, oh, we're doing really well. But if you look at pre-pandemic, we're actually not at pre-pandemic numbers. We're just higher than our lower expectation of the upcoming of the current fiscal year and expectation for next year yeah you just lowered the standards basically lowered the benchmark <laughs> yeah the, the press doesn't do a good job with that explanation we, we just lowered our benchmarks uh that's why we're here tacky to, to shed light on that <laughs> exactly so no we're not doing great we're just doing better than we expected that's all so i mean but in the same time that you know five billion ish plus coming to the state directly for COVID assistance over two years will definitely help us balance our budget. I mean, we spent well into a billion dollars in the first part of the pandemic. We spent another billion dollars on just health care in the second part of the pandemic, uh, plus, you know, hundreds of million dollars on various economic assistance issues, including unemployment benefits. And of course, we'll be spending billions of dollars ourselves on unemployment benefits from our own system. So COVID-19 has been very, very expensive for state government. And city and local government um, as well, as, as you're well aware, sure. Absolutely. And uh, we've actually agreed to uh, our local aid numbers. We are going to fulfill our law regarding uh, higher assistance on Chapter 70 education money decisions in towns and regional school districts. So we are going to fulfill um, our promise on that uh, from the, um, in, uh, you know, whatever the, I'm trying to the name of it now, because they're all like little, every, that, everyone does like an, an anagram these days, but it's the education funding enhancement that we proved in the law last cycle. Oh, right. Um, yeah. Pre-pandemic, we approved that. Yep. Uh, we, we didn't fund it, obviously, last year because of the insanity of, of this economic situation. But th this year, we're going to start our six years of enhanced um, education assistance for season temps. Yeah, I think it means about six million more for Quincy, as I recall correctly. Yeah, between six and eight million, Yeah, um, depending on where you are in the cycle, because it's a formula-based system. So okay. as the number of, as the student census changes your uh, amount, generally changes a little bit, but really, you never see it go down. I mean, really, you see it go down because the census and schools are generally fairly stable and rising, especially in Quincy. You know, it's, it's very much a lot of young families here. Yeah. What do you think about the uh, effort to eliminate MCAS this, again this year? I support that yeah. this year. I mean, the pandemic has made it extremely difficult for kids to get, you know, 
you know, it's just hard. It's just very kid, very hard, not in person of everybody, uh, the lack of socialization and the lack of direct interaction between teachers is tough because if you need extra assistance, it's, it's much harder. And if you're not a native English speaker, you know, the, the standardized test is already tough enough, mm-hmm. when, you know, in this kind of educational environment, because you have to provide um, additional uh, language assistance for those children. So I, I don't have a problem pushing it off another year. Um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of standardized tests. I've said that before. Mm-hmm. I'm not going yep. them myself. But, you know, I still don't like the idea of education taught to a test as opposed to education taught for life. But that's just me. Yeah. Uh, it'd be interesting to see um, if the higher educational institutions take note of that and change, I don't know, their admissions policies or their, uh, their standards at least. Yeah, some schools have been starting to move away from the SATs and looking yeah. more holistic approach regarding students because the standardized test does not fully respect the capacity of a student. So I'm a classic example of that. I mean, I did get to college and I did get to law school, but I did not have stellar mm. test scores by any stretch. My SAT scores were somewhat mediocre, uh, despite the fact, you know, I'm an honor society at BC High. I don't standardize tests well. And, um, you know, I was not a top 10 or top five student at BC High either. It's a very competitive school, trust me. Getting top five, top ten is very hard yeah. at BC High. Yeah. Very competitive. Uh, but I know I, I got into New England Law School, um, you know, with not very good LSAT scores, um, you know, toward the bottom half of the uh, LSAT list. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but they look at totality of circumstances. So, LSAT is only one factor they look at totality of the student before they offer um, admission. So, you know, there may be, you know, more shifts going on as we move forward regarding what is a good student. Does one exam tell the story? And my life tells me no. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's, well, the, some people just don't test well, too, you know, under under pressure for, for taking the test can have an impact on the results. Well, it's not kind of testing, right? I mean, everybody had different test experiences in what school you have. So some schools are heavily mobile choice. Some schools are exam driven. You know, standardized tests are logic driven multiple choice. And it's, it's one size fit all mm. as taking the bar exam myself mm-hmm. as a written and a multiple choice component. <laughs> um, the multiple choice does not actually, uh, the multiple choice, what we call the multi-state portion does not automatically get you in. If you have a high score, you still have to meet the benchmark in the written section. Yeah. So you actually have to pass both sections of the exam. Um, so, um, you know, it's like I said, I think this debate is going to be very heavy going into, um, the future now regarding whether standards has makes sense on, on college admissions. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the vaccine rollout and how you're kind of rating the state's success with that right now. Uh, we're doing a little bit better. I mean, you know, about the, what, approximately one sixth of the state is vaccinated at this point. Uh, I have to be honest, I'm shocked um, because there's a lot of people, <laughs> there's a lot of needles and a lot of vials. And we talked about supply chain problems before. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, you know, I think people don't realize everything from those alcohol swaps to actually getting the vaccine as part of a supply chain question. Yeah. So I'm actually very pleasantly surprised and very happy to see the supply chain actually good. Um, we're not hearing shortages of nope. how to get you the vaccine. The challenge is that getting the vaccine. So, you know, one sixth, it's now April. The vaccination started you know, late January, early February. Um, with Johnson & Johnson coming online. You know, I know despite there was a manufacturing issue with one of the vendors, uh, with, the, with people like Merck, Americ, you know, another massive pharmaceutical company helping make the vaccine. I think we might get really close to heavily uh, vaccinated by half the population by late June or early July. I mm-hmm. actually think that may happen. I mean, we still have to get to 70, 75% vaccination. But that's not unrealistic getting to 50% by, by midsummer. At this, at this pace, right, if the pace keeps up, for sure, yeah. Yeah, the only really thing stopping us at this stage is us, you know, ourselves wanting to go get vaccinated. I think, you know, I think the the manufacturing process has reached kind of a, a fair level of consistency. And the one-shot vaccine makes scheduling so much easier for everyone, one and done. So I'm feeling much more optimistic than I was six months ago, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, that's good to hear, especially from you, Tacky. <laughs> yeah, you and me, Tacky. We all know this from this point if you watch the show enough times. That's right. <laughs> you know, it still can be better. I think we all agree with that. I yeah. mean, you know, re- you know, using the uh, public um, boards of public health more, you know, coordinating of local community health centers more, 
according to local doctors groups more. But that being said, you know, the numbers show things are getting better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you still um, hearing hesitancy within, say, communities of color? Yeah, that continues to be a, a concern. Uh, well, it's actually interesting. It's community colors, but also people in the healthcare industry themselves. Yep. I think what is driving a lot of that is to, I think what's driving that, the big one's driving that is the speed of the um, approval process for this vaccine. And uh, you, know, you hear you know, constantly through pandemic component, this could take two years, this is a long process, you have to make sure it's actually safe, you know, it's not FDA approved, so, you know, it's only FDA approved. A emergency approved and people get that sense that it's not safe because it didn't have like the standard process yeah that's the process they feel that it may miss something um so the good thing is that the world is one giant test case so something comes up we're going to know about it and secondly they did actually go through a clinical trial process that's required by fda in the u.s but unlike they've done in the past they did overlapping trials so they started trial one then halfway through trial one they started trial two while trial one was still going on and then trial three was, you know, was started well and it missed the trial two. So as a result, you know, it's a, it, it did follow the correct process and it was accelerated. And as you saw in the news, I mean, when something went wrong, they slowed the process down. Um, and there was a commitment by, you know, basically all the Western world, European and North American companies uh, to not uh, go cheap, essentially, on trials. Right. And this is new technology. I mean, the mRNA process is actually cheaper and more efficient than the conventional take your virus apart process. So the uh, old days, uh, which is still being used, they're not really at all. I mean, most other countries are still doing the whole take the virus, uh, take it apart, take the DNA apart, take the DNA apart to the section of the RNA that you need uh, to tell your body to make the antibodies. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of having to take a virus apart we just manufacture the rna ourselves so the mnra code is what tells your body what to do in fighting a virus so you're getting no dead virus there's no D virus dna in your body it's just instructional codes of the R rmna which identifies you know it is a virus that tells your body to manufacture the antibodies and prepare your defenses um, so you're going to see i think a uh, much more efficient rollout on, on u.s and european drugs than you will see i think in china because the manufacturing process here is, is, is actually much faster and much cheaper. Hmm. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see if there are others that come online as well. I know there are still some in, uh, in trials uh, overseas. Yeah. Novavac is on trials. They should get ready for FDA approval probably within two months. Yeah. As the test is still not approved by the U S obviously it was the blood clot problem with small yeah. number of people in Europe. There, there's been a lot of halting over there. The EU is actually very behind in vaccinations as a result. There's also some political issues regarding vaccine diplomacy. We kind of touched on that in the past. Over in Europe, um, it isn't because they're not, not making Europe first. People shouldn't believe that. The Europeans definitely making Europe first on vaccination. It's just things are, are kind of rougher than we're having it here um, regarding uh, the Azatesca vaccine as well as you know, how much is actually available. Mm. So we're you know in the greatest country in the world, in my mind still, and we have three companies that are making... Uh, vaccine at a record pace, uh, three different companies competing and also, uh, you know, meeting our needs and eventually also the world needs. And don't be surprised if there may be another two more coming up just out of this country. Hmm. Okay. Curious to see uh, what you think about uh, the, the issue of having a vaccine passport came up earlier this week and, you know, the governor didn't want to really address it. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm kind of disappointed the governor didn't want to address this one. I mean, Hospitality and tourism is number two industry in Massachusetts. Uh, I, I, I know some listeners, you know, are work in hospitality, restaurants, hotels, tour guides, et cetera. And they're feeling a huge economic impact from the lack of visitors. Not, you know, and we're an international city. Mm -hmm. The majority of nonstop flights are not going right now out of this country and into this country uh, via Logan Airport. That's a massive economic loss for us. So I'm a little surprised that government didn't want to at least try to address the issue, at least in, in the sense of one of our major economic drivers. The reality is this, the hospitality and the, and the travel industry is going to have to require some level of verification of negative COVID for you to travel. You know, you're in a basically small space on a plane or a bus with other people. Despite the ventilation, anything can still happen with those contacts. 
and, and frankly, I would like to travel again soon as much as everybody else because mm -hmm. I, I could use um, some time off, um, the same as everybody else listening to this right now. Right. And uh, I'd like to be able to be unfound because cell phone and people can find me using the cell phone. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, I think what's going to happen, whether people listening like it or not, is that the industries themselves, particularly in hospitality, are going to take the initiative regarding COVID negative. I mean, the cruise industry is already implementing a program to have COVID negative on their ships. Yep. Um, because the, the risk factor is too high. I mean, you, you know, neurovirus is scary on a cruise ship. You know, Lord help you as COVID, as we saw this past winter time with all those ships trapped in the Pacific. That's there right. was nowhere to go. You know, floating out of the sea because no one would take them. It's like a leper ship, right? Nobody wants them to come to port. So, you know, people can talk about all they want about, you know, well, it's not fair. Well, it's not about you anymore, folks. It's about all of us. And the sooner you come to that realization, get over it. I don't know what else to tell you. Mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to die because of your selfishness. Well, have my mother die because of your selfishness. And it's just the bottom line. And the various hospitality industries are probably going to be the first one right off the bat, uh, setting up protocols before even the government does. Yeah. Will we have a COVID vaccine, a vaccine uh, passport? The question, that's very simple. It's an international standard. Yep. And uh, the big power players is the EU, China, the US, Japan, South Korea, you know, Canada. I mean, you know, the, India, these are your top 10 big economies. Um, the great the British are a top 10 economy. Um, they're probably going to drive what the vaccine passports mm -hmm. going to look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you I know, think they're right. Economies. And then the Biden administration seems to be uh, letting it uh, kind of play out that way as well. Yeah, if the, pass if the vaccine certification is not accepted by all countries, we still can't go anywhere. So the U.S. is going to be very hesitant to allow people into the country who aren't uh, COVID negative mm -hmm. vaccinated uh, if we do not accept their verification system, right? So, you know, it's kind of this, you know, interesting argument that, you know, we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't uh, have vaccine, vaccine passports, but you want to leave the country, but you don't want to demonstrate to where you're going that you're vaccinated or you're COVID negative. Right. So it cuts both ways. And now you want people to come to this country to contribute to you know, two to three billion dollars of an economic driver in Massachusetts, but you don't want you don't want them you don't want vaccine or COVID negative verification before they come to Massachusetts. Right. You can't you can't have the standard be like a one direction issue. It's gotta be a, a, a standard that we all accept. Yeah. I'm curious. I I haven't researched really what happened after the nineteen eighteen pandemic, you know, and and, and how there was, there was verification, yeah. They did. Okay. Yeah. yeah they did. They, they passport, uh, passport or, or healthcare verification is not new in this country. It's not new internationally. Thankfully, the the uh, the 1918 flu kind of wore itself out by 1921. It, yeah. it kind of went away. But in the interim, I mean, yeah, there was actually people who had uh, doctors no certifications regarding their uh, actually having the flu. Mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't, of course, the global travel then that there is today either. Oh, absolutely correct. And uh, people look at me in the archives back then in 1980 flu. And since you know, it was very decentralized medical care, every community had different attitudes. Mm -hmm. And after World War I, you know, obviously a lot of parades, but a lot of communities didn't have parades because of the fear of the Spanish flu. Yep. And as a result, uh, you know, 1980, those communities had very low infection rates versus those that had, did have parades. This, you can find this. This actually is documented. People are mm -hmm. hunting for these documents. Now, and uh, same thing regarding mass usage. Communities that had mass usage had low infection rates and those that did. And the, the way they find out is how many hospitalizations we know. So. Yeah, I mean, it's even, you know, at its core, it's, it is a respiratory virus and that's how it, that's how it spreads. Absolutely. I mean, I've been getting out in public a little bit more because people see me outside and uh, I still try my best to keep three to six or even more away from people um, as I'm backing up as people walk closer. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I know we're very social people. We like to come up and, and say hello, but I'm kind of like, you know, d d d d d personal space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although it, your hair looks pretty coiffed today, to Tacky. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's not, it's not giving me personal space, my hair, as we've seen over the course of many weeks. Uh, 
you, you, it might be, you might be hosting the hair at some point by itself. <laughs> Go back to the, the 70s shag look, right? <laughs> um, can I ask you a little bit about a um, uh, rally that's happening at Quincy Center on uh, Saturday? Uh, Quincy Asian Resources are putting this, uh, this together. Yeah, we're doing a Stop Asian, Asian uh, Hate Rally. Actually, I'm not. It's Quincy Asian Resources working in the city of Quincy and a number of different local organizations. So uh, I'm not in charge of the planning process. I'm along for a ride okay. uh, to uh, talk. And uh, it is, my understanding, it's going to be a list of a combination of elected officials and community folks to talk about um, the fact that we've all experienced this, um, even myself. I mean, elected just because I have a title and elected official and people think I'm important doesn't make me immune to racist and bigotry behavior. Mm. Um, so, you know, let's just get out there. Money and title doesn't make you different. You know, you're not immune to this type of bigotry and hatred. So uh, I think it's important to keep this on the forefront. There's also one going on in Dorchester, the Vietnamese community tomorrow morning oh. as well. Um, and I suspect there'll be uh, more of these rallies moving forward in different communities at different times just to keep awareness in the matter. Mm -hmm. So you have time, I, well, obviously the, this posting may be too, you know, after the event, but um, I'm hoping that you know, you'll be a decent showing tomorrow at 11 a.m. and we're gonna try to keep it under an hour, I was told. But it will be a, a rather, uh, robust speaking group of electeds and community members sharing their stories. Yeah, in a socially distanced manner, certainly, in a safe manner, uh, for sure. Oh, yeah, please don't come too close to me. <laughs> um, you know, what do you kind of hope will come out of this discussion, if you will, or movements, um, both in the city and in the state? Well, I think the key word is discussion, right? I mean, my big fear, again, has always been a 1982 Vincent Chin situation where, you know, you got a way of murder, literally, uh, you know, three years probation and $3,000 fine. Um, it is not 1982. Mm -hmm. And uh, given the BLM movement best this past summer, there's a greater awareness. But unfortunately, our demographic, uh, you know, wasn't quite swept into BLM regarding greater awareness. And I'm very happy that now there is greater awareness. I think in the last couple of weeks, people have, again, paid more attention to the history of Asian Americans and the inherent uh, base of, uh, of the country here of why this country is anti-Asian mm. at some level. If you look at the history, there's a continuous trend. And people are like, well, it was a long time ago. Yeah, but the long time ago determines how we behave today uh, because it's, it's now part of the accepted behavior. We all go through this, including myself. I mean, I remind folks, I was as provincial as everybody else in Quincy. I mean, I'm super protective of my neighborhood, right? And uh, that's a simple example of that, right? I'm a Walston kid. I'm very proud of it very protective of my neighborhood. But, you know, when I go visit House Neck, you know, they are very protective of their neighborhood and have a whole different neighborhood upbringing than I do in Walls. It's very provincial. And that's just from hundreds of years of Quincy life mm -hmm. creating this kind of local culture. Uh, same thing happens on a big scale regarding people of different races and ethnicities. Uh, it really doesn't matter. And it's, it's a lot of history that goes on behind it. And some things change for the better and sometimes it doesn't. So, I mean, we could do a whole hour in the history lesson if you want to on a different day. Yeah. But, you know, it's all there. It doesn't matter if you're an immigrant that came recently, you've been here four generations. Well, that was past actions by the U.S. government and the filtration into uh, our base culture uh, is part of that. For example, cultural appropriation. It's one thing to buy uh, lovely cultural items when you travel because you enjoy them, they're part of uh, your life, uh, the good memories. But it's different if you do cultural appropriation for financial gain. Mm. where you uh, take another person's culture and uh, decides to use it to finance yourself. And then whatever that person says is the acceptance of what that item represents. And we've seen that as celebrities over many years, especially in the field of fashion. And there's been a lot of pushback uh, recently. I remember most recently there was one regarding kimonos. I can't remember the celebrity, but I mean, there was a lot of pushback and the result they didn't realize they were being culturally insensitive. Mm. So greater awareness is, is, is a big part of what we're seeing now. And, it's good, uh, but it's a continual conversation we need to have and greater education about all of us, you know, our uh, contributions as well as our faults. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, education, I think, is what you said was the key. I've seen, you know, I've worked in the city uh, 30 plus years and um, I just recently started to see some movements, um, at least toward having a higher representation of people of color, say in the administration or even in the school system. Um, law enforcement, things of that nature, but it's slow. 
it's slow. I mean, it's a, it's just a battle of inches, not yards, in terms of moving forward, as I look at it. And I've been, you know, doing battles in the city myself in my younger days. Obviously, I'm in an elected position now. So how I go about my business tends to be a little bit more different approach, especially since I'm dealing with a lot more state-level issues than I did in my younger days. But simple things like translation services, you know, is not complicated. If you look at other communities that have large people of color, one of the things they've really made an effort to is improve government communications. Mm. I'm now in a fight with my House Asian Caucus and uh, the Black Latino Caucus and generally membership at the moment because pandemic has shown that state government's ability to provide uh, linguistic services or unemployment benefits has been abysmal, mm. absolutely abysmal. And we're getting the same feeling that these uh, grants that governors put out for small business also has a, a linguistic challenge as well. Mm. Because while they did priority women and people of color on these grants, um, I think not everyone was able to take full advantage of them because I don't think they did a great job on communication. Yeah. And, uh, this, this is a big um, you know, basic issue about government access. So um, if you look at places like Chelsea and Lowell and others, they've been making little strides forward and opening up government to the public more. But, you know, again, it's up to the city council and the mayor uh, to decide exactly how much they will open government to the old people. Yeah. And, I, you know, I'm curious if it's a if it's a Northeast or New England thing, because uh, I know other parts of the country are much more international and certainly places in Europe. Um, it, multilingual has been the standard for years. Absolutely correct. It, it is a very New Englander thing, I think. It's, 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 as we say, as I said before, American culture is very complicated. Yeah. Because there is no one American culture. I mean, right. you know, people from Boston, it's very different from people from the Berkshires, for mm-hmm. sakes. I mean, even in Massachusetts, we have very different uh, cultural aspects in our own state. So, uh, you know, we have a very mentality here since I was a child. I've noticed this is that, you know, we're great. You should come here. We don't have to do any more. Well, we know that's not true. I, I'm a competitive guy. I mean, I believe that. If you want to attract tourists, you want to attract the best talent, you have to compete for that. You have to figure out what it takes to get it. Yeah. Uh, just because we're here doesn't make us important. And uh, as much as I take pride in my own city and my own state, as well as this country as a whole, you know, competition is what makes us great. And, uh, you know, we will beat people uh, if we want to beat them uh, in terms of uh, economic challenges, whether it be a neighboring state or even in our case, a neighboring city or town. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you're right. It's a very provincial mentality. Yeah. Uh, and it sometimes loses sight of the fact that we are an international community. And the city of Boston and the greater Boston area, you know, will be a, a, a enormous population of immigrants. I think almost two thirds wow. of the greater Boston area is an immigrant of some form at this stage. So and that brings up an interesting question we haven't talked about in a while. Have you heard anything more about the census? No. The last <laughs> newsletter I got said September 30th. But okay. there's hope it will be closer to July 1st. I heard some rumors about that, but we know when we know when we know. Um, for those people who realize that city council should have approved the precinct lines, you know, at least had draft of precinct lines by now, and hopefully been approved before the summertime for the municipal elections. They have to have these precinct lines approved prior to municipal elections so you can take out nomination papers in the right ward if you want to work for district councilor or ward councilor. So, you know, if, if it isn't ready for, if we don't have numbers for the deadline, you're going to be working in the current precincts and you're going to look for one for office. But then we have a problem in our stage because I need the precinct lines of the city to determine what my rep district looks like as we kind of take how many people in each precinct and I got to do the math with, you know, whatever the population of Massachusetts is divided by 160 people. Right. So we might have our own uh, district maps pushed out to the 2024 election. Hmm. Um, and we're going to have to change the law to do that. So, I know they're using uh, estimates now, yeah. uh, you know, projection estimates, not the actual numbers to start the process. But until we actually have re- actual numbers, there's not much more we can do. So we may have to uh, pass a law to push everything out two years. Right, right. Um, the As I understand, the governor's emergency uh, declaration order expires June 30th. Is that right? Oh, it expires as long until he decides not to expire it. So okay. All right. don't get caught up on those dates. He, okay. uh, he, can, he has the ability to move those around. Oh, he does. Okay. Yeah. Or you can issue a new order immediately afterwards. Okay. So uh, I suspect that uh, as the phase reopening continues, uh, you know, it would determine largely how much longer this executive order will continue. Right. I would think, too, he wouldn't want to shut the state off from receiving any more federal help um, if it's not in a state of emergency. 
Absolutely. We actually are receiving a lot of female monies. So a lot yeah. of what's going on here actually also has a female component because you're treating it like any other natural disaster. Right. You know, the, Biden, uh, the Trump administration kind of started that process, but the Biden administration set that into overdrive. They've fully admitted this is a natural disaster situation and uh, made access of female monies throughout the country. And uh, one example of that is, is housing issues. Um, mm. People are, are becoming homeless because of COVID for economic means. Uh, the the uh, people who are in homeless shelters right now uh, can't be in close quarters. If you visit homeless shelters, you understand what I'm talking about regarding close quarters and you know, FEMA money is being used to kind of separate everybody out for the moment until uh, we get through the vaccination process. So, you know, there, there's a lot of different pools of money floating around. Medicare money been floating mm -hmm. around all year uh, to try to keep the hospitals alive. I don't think people realize Berkshire Hospital was under the verge of collapse. Lawrence Hospital was on the verge of collapse during mm -hmm. last summertime. Uh, and the uh, Trump administration, as well as the state, and now with the Biden administration, has been doing everything we can to keep these community hospitals open with no will we'll reduce elected uh, medical procedures while being extraordinarily COVID ready. And now hospitals in Massachusetts have designated ICU COVID hospitals. So, you know, people have been moving around over the state. And yeah. as we've all seen on the Nightly Leals, you know, hospitalization rates are up again and so is infection rates. So this is a grave concern because I do not want to see us go back on phase reopening. Yeah, it looks like the variants are really wreaking havoc right now. Well, uh, supposedly the sample testing indicates that the UK variant seems to be the dominant variant at the moment. Right. The New York uh, outbreak was from Europe. It wasn't actually from China because the uh, virus already had a mutation that showed it was a European mutation. So the West Coast definitely was coming in from China. The East Coast definitely came in from Europe. Yep. Based on science. Yeah. Have you heard anything about the efficacy of the vaccines against the variant? J and J, Johnson Johnson, it was actually tested in the midst of the variants. Oh. So if you got a Johnson Johnson vaccine, uh, know that your uh, vaccination happened in the middle of the variants. Uh, Moderna and Pfizer are conducting tests. They believe their advisors, uh, I'm sorry, their uh, vaccine is effective against the variants. Um, for example, Moderna, you know, had been down in South Africa. I think Pfizer's also went down there too because of the South African variant. Yep. Running clinical tests down there, start to test one, two, three, you know, trials down there to see what would happen. Things are positive. Um, so uh, do not go vaccine shopping. Right. Get the vaccine that's made available to you. Definitely make the time to do that. Do not worry about one being more effective than others. The test, as a clinical test, will always continue at this yep. stage. Uh, I think the data will show that the efficacy rate will be pretty much the same across the board. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the overall goal right, is herd immunity, right? So uh, all three will help us get there. That's correct. I mean, we can stop the infection rate among people, but those, you know, it will result in those of us who haven't been vaccinated yet not getting sick uh, and then prevent you know, the disease from finding a new host. That's what vaccination herd immunity is about, is to try to cut off the, um, the va virus from having a new host and, you know, manufacturing jump. So... You know, the number is like 70% more infected than the UK variant. So if you take 2.5 persons infected, after touching one infected person, he made that add 70% to that. I mean, you're close, you're talking close to over four, four people were infected on the UK virus from that more first contact. Yep. So, I mean, it, it can, it can, you, it can almost double uh, the probability of you being infected. Get your shot. Get your shot and continue with the chant we've been saying for three years now about masks and hygiene and don't touch people who are not feeling well. I mean, it's it's the same. Once again, I'm always shocked. It's like, what kind of hygiene were we doing before this? <laughs> That's it, so it, true. <laughs> 30 people? I mean, what was going on before pandemic? Did we just realize we're not, like, hygiene sensitive? <laughs> I, 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 I can get over that. It was certainly not in the forefront uh, of our of our minds like it is now. That's for sure. No, I mean definitely. Uh, you know, definitely. I hope this is a lesson for everybody. To continue to, uh, the same hygienic uh, process we've been doing for the past year, and you know, I, and not stop. Yeah, I mean, not only for a pandemic, but uh, for bacterial infections, for other viruses. You know, it's just it's just good overall. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get the neurovirus, folks. We don't have a vaccine for that one. Right. Right. You know, not fun. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, in general, like food poisoning issues, right? It's largely mm -hmm. done from um, uh, bacteria on the outside of your skin. You don't wash your hands while serving food or cooking food. You can 
uh, drop some of those uh, exterior skin bacteria and some of those ingested and you get it to be a food poison too. Yep. So it's yep. not just rotted food. It can actually come from um, uh, epidermic uh, bacteria that floats outside of your skin that mm -hmm. you wait and try to get inside of it. You know, what we haven't talked about, uh, Taki, is I'm curious what your take is on the, the current housing situation in Massachusetts, the, the boom, and, and if you're worried about a bust. Well, the, well, it depends. I mean, it depends on how uh, the flight from Boston continues. Yeah. And urban areas have become very unattractive because of the nature of COVID. Um, again, if you're in a multi-unit building that's vertical, um, if one person gets sick, you know, there's a possibility that everyone will get sick as well. Uh, there might be a drive to get out of multi-unit uh, mm -hmm. living. Uh, people always love Boston because of convenience of walking in the, in the public transit, but public transit is scary because, again, you're in an enclosed space. Um, and, you know, living in enclosed tight space areas, people that know Selfie and Dorchester and locales know there's almost no distance between homes. So, in you know, my friends uh, who represent, uh, you know, regions like Back Bay and Beacon Hill, you know, the reps up there, or have seen um, that lights not come back home. Uh, I'm sorry, lights not come back on of the neighbors. They haven't been back yet. So I do think housing uh, boom will continue okay. uh, as people leave Boston or other dense neighborhoods uh, to suburban communities uh, with uh, wide yards and, and space. Mm -hmm. I do think this is also a reflection of income inequality because uh, people means are going to move. Mm -hmm. and we saw that throughout the pandemic. This, the question becomes what happens to Boston real estate prices and other dense community real estate prices, both commercial and residential, because yeah. your customers are leaving. It's not just they're leaving, but the customers are leaving and they may have extended vacancies because, you know, it's not like, you know, I'm going to move into Boston and spend, you know, eight times what I pay in Quincy. Right. or whatever ridiculous amount of money you have to spend. Uh, but on the flip side, it's going to drive up prices here at home too. So, okay. you know, your property taxes is partially driven by uh, home valuation. Every time sells a home, people sell a home, great, my value goes up, so does your property tax. So, and then we'll see on retirements. I fully expect in the public sector, there's going to be a lot of retirements happening um, because people are making that real decision about how they want to spend the quality of life. Uh, you know, in their second half of their lives. If we have kids that are out of school and mortgage is paid, you're going to have to start thinking about what's mo what's the most important thing to you at the time. Yeah, so, I think you're right. There's a lot of reassessments going on, I think, uh, especially if you're if you're closer to retirement than not. We saw that last spring prior to nomination papers being due in the middle of the pandemic. You know, some older uh, reps, you know, started thinking about whether or not they should run again. Some decided to do it one more time and some decided not to. I think we're going to see the same decision again coming this winter time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because all the elected officials around the state are going to reevaluate whether or not, you know, running every two years, dealing with you know, all the stuff that we deal with. Um, is it worth it or is it better to enjoy your kids and grandkids and uh, slow down your life a bit and enjoy what you have? Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, personal decision, but I'm anticipating a lot of uh, retirements, uh, as part of a pandemic in the public sector. Uh, I do think uh, to maintain a workforce in the private sector, particularly in the white collar industries, which is about 35 to 40% of the state, hmm. uh, you know, you're gonna see massive changes as part of that. And part of it will probably to, uh, to try to retain workforce, mm -hmm. you know, get not to retire. Because the market's great right now. I mean, if you're gonna cash out uh, on your 401ks, this is the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trouble is um, with the cost of living around here, unless you're going to like Ohio or, or something, um, it's not going to last too long. <laughs> yeah, you're actually right. You know, so people are going to gonna move, right? They either yeah. move to a lower cost of living part of the state or they uh, move to another part of the country. If they're comfortable enough to move to another part of the country right. or, or they wait it out to vaccine gets better and then move to another part of the country. Right. I think there'll be a lot of migration in this country largely driven by uh, economics and uh, personal safety uh, in the next year. I mm -hmm. think we've seen some migration internally quite a bit. Yeah. Do you think, how do you think it will impact Quincy uh, in particular? Oh, housing. I mean, I see houses signs go up, you know, in the neighborhood of my, you know, quick walks around trying to get some air. And uh, the houses are not sticking on the market very long from my observation no. this past winter. So I expect and <laughs> the audience is going to not like this. Your property value is going to go up. Your yep. taxes are going to go up with that property value increase. Uh, the question it becomes is what happens to all these new multi-unit housing developments? Right. Yep. 
It's kind of like, yeah, a game of musical chairs. You know, they're going up so fast. Uh, <laughs> which one is going to get stuck with an empty building? That is a legitimate question. Yeah. And uh, even the downtown project, you know, that's a very good question. And uh, for remote, lear- uh, remote uh, work, you know, the question is, you know, how much office space does one really need? Or do you go to more of a shared space situation? For example, mm-hmm. Red Lorraine C has a shared space office up in North Quincy mm-hmm. uh, by the Bank of America you know, try to see if she can capitalize on people working from home, but they need a meeting space to meet folks or, um, you know, just need some temporary space here and there just to get out of the house yep. uh, on a scheduled manner and, uh, you know, on low rent um, because it's a share rent cost uh, in a walking distance neighborhood. So is that the future? Well, my friend Lorraine is gambling that this may be the future of um, office space. Huh. She may be right. Uh, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, sea changes that we don't even know yet uh, yeah, going forward. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. you know, as I've talked to you, this medium of communication has been great. As much as I love you know, coming to the off, uh, coming to the studio, talking about Crosby, which you know, obviously we're having a, a, a social distant pangs, not to spend time together. Uh, you know, this has really changed how uh, I communicate, and you yeah. have seen me more in the past year. Have you seen me in ten years? That's very true, yeah. Um, what's going on at the Registry of Motor Vehicles? <laughs> They're just not having a good time. That whole agency has been having a bad time for a long, long, long time. Really has. Going back in ancient history, I mean, uh, you know, Krabowski, when he was the R&B guy, had really modernized the thing and, yep. you know, brought it very high efficiency, best of customer service mentality. And ever since Krabowski left during the Romney administration, it's been a downhill trend ever since. Uh, let's be honest about it, folks. And you know, when I'm talking about Mitt Romney governor time, I'm mean, talking about a long time ago. Long time ago, yeah. So you know, the combination of it's, you know failure of technology uh, plus pandemic plus outsourcing at some level has resulted in a combination disaster. And it's squarely you know on the arm you know the registrar of the RMV you know is responsible for this. Um, I don't know when they're going to get this resolved. Um, you know, I don't think they do either. <laughs> I agree with that, actually. I don't think they know, and I have no idea. I yeah. mean, you know, they, they have been migrating over to a new inspection system for two years. Um, we are a low-bid state, guys, just to remind you all. We take the lowest bidder based on whether they can perform. So yeah. that actually works against us. I think in, in technology in particular, and we saw this with the with the web portal for vaccines. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that. <laughs> that little issue. Um, low bid doesn't always work for us. Yeah. Uh, it's not the days of construction with the days of technology and sometimes going cheap is what you get today. And uh, I know the public doesn't like the government to spend more money than they have to, but then we have these situations and people are like, what happened? Well, we're a little bit state. We take the, the lowest offer, the lowest they can meet the contract standards and they screw up because they're not good quality, even though they can make the standards. Yeah. The public loses. Um, yeah. This is actually a conversation we've been having uh, again in the state. I was about a, about whether we should change low bid law, hmm. uh, maybe in certain sectors. I'm not saying we will, but you know the public is feeling it. Yeah, or at least uh, readjust the standards for who qualifies for for being able to bid. Absolutely, because yeah. obviously you know we want to save money. At this part, we want the bid standard. We want a competitive bid process so people offer the best price possible. But you, we also want quality work. Right. And notice that a lot of our problems on low bid is right now technology driven. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Anything else coming up we should know about right now, Tacky? Um. Well, I, I don't know. I think uh, uh, right now I kind of advise that people uh, uh, do watch uh, Asian Americans on Amazon Prime. I think I mentioned this before. You did, yeah. Interest on a- uh, Asian American history. Uh, it does a very good, very good synopsis because there's a lot of history, but they condense it. The key points uh, condense into a five-hour documentary I, I, I watched it last year i really encourage everyone to watch it this year yeah. um, and um beyond that you know get vaccinated please uh, and uh, stay healthy and stay safe and obviously my office is available to answer questions at 617-722-2014 617-722-2014 just slap a button and so we'll get back to you as well as uh, tacky.chana and mahouse.gov and you all know my facebook at uh uh, Tacky Chan State Representative, as well as my Twitter account at Tacky Chan. Um, you find up uh, me and uh, Senator Warren in last week. I've never seen that many hits on my Twitter account in my <laughs> life. Uh, so clearly, you know, you uh, were someone that has a much more Twitter, bigger Twitter universe than yours. 
uh, it, it's quite remarkable watching the statistics. And also thank you to QATV, you sent out statistics over to us about viewership. Um, and uh, it appears people do like to see us. Which is kind of nice, uh, you anyway, I don't know about me, but it's kind of <laughs> nice to know somebody's watching, yeah. <laughs> you know, I thank everybody for, uh, you know, tuning in as well. Um, so, you know, stay tuned. I mean, AAPM month is coming in May, and it was very early in April, but May will be here before we know it. I was surprised we got just showed up in April. Just just happened. I was like, April already? Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll have something to talk about next week about how the budget's going to roll out. Okay. And see where we are there. And um, uh, I think, uh, the, you know, after St. Patrick's Day, I think you're going to feel a big impact in hospitality, hospitality, um, Patriot's Day week. Yes. Yep. We'll see. Um, all right. We will see you in a week, Techie. Talk to you then, Joe. Be well, right, be safe.